Trevor Ngobe uh, is, a, is a friend of mine. He was on the board, as I mentioned earlier, at MoneyWeb. He's an entrepreneur, newspaper publisher. You would recall the Mail and Guardian. We tried to do a deal together at MoneyWeb, which would have been fantastic. But unfortunately, we would, we would never have won the change room, Warren. Remember, we always talk about winning the change room at, at Arena. Well, we could never have won the change room at, at, at M&G. And when I realized that, we walked it well. We not. We both decided not to continue with it. Trevor, uh, he was born in Bulawayo. Uh, he has a BA honors in economic history. Started his life as a teacher, and in 1989 went into financial journalism with the Financial Gazette. He was the editor of the Financial Gazette in in Zim, which was a a, a very good pa a paper. At the age of 29, I had to work that out from your profile. A young achiever, Trev, and you've you've aged well. He, uh, we knew each other uh, well here in South Africa. But in between, he's always been Zimbabwean. He's always been passionate about his country, uh, and he's suffered as a consequence. In 2005, he had his passport taken away by the Mugabe government. Uh, after he got it back by going to court, they tried to then remove his citizenship and the reason or the pretext for that was that his father was Zambian. Now, <laughs> why go to so much trouble? Well, because Trevor owns newspapers and his newspapers were highly critical of the Mugabe government. And as they were highly critical of the Mugabe government, clearly they did not want uh, him to be publishing anymore and Foreigners may not own newspapers in Zimbabwe. So if you could take this guy born in Bulawayo and somehow magic him out of his citizenship, you wouldn't have his newspapers anymore. Trevor then came to South Africa during the, the worst of that time. Uh, he's been globally uh, uh, acknowledged for, for his fight for freedom. And, and why I'm so interested in talking to Tre uh, hearing what Trevor has to say now is because he did the unthinkable. He actually went back home after Mugabe died. Sorry, not died, was deposed. And we were all in this country very excited about it. And I thought about my friend Trevor, and I remember sitting in your office at the Mail and Guardian after one of the elections, and you said, these bastards have... You didn't say that. These people have stolen this election. The, and that was just so true and they had stolen the election it appeared at the time running into it there was great optimism that finally Mugabe would would uh, be democratically overthrown and then when Mnangagwa took over Trevor went back home and has been fighting the good fight there I've had an interview recently with your former uh, well with your your countryman and namesake Ntuli Ngube the finance minister, remember he was on your board at, at Mail and Guardian, and he was giving me lots of good stories about Zim. He was saying how things are really going in the right direction. Uh, and, and he is a, a, a man whose who's understanding and insights do carry a lot of weight. Trevor, however, has always, I'm not to say that Ntuli doesn't, but Trevor always talks the truth. He's a man of God. He believes in our uh, a higher power uh, that what we do on earth um, has to has to conform to some higher standards of ethics so what he's going to tell you today i can assure you will be not just coming from the heart but will be coming from a very factual base trevor Ngobe, let's welcome him Good afternoon, morning, everybody. Um, I've been waiting for too long. It's already an afternoon for me. I love that song that played, My African Dream, There's a New Tomorrow, because I surely believe that one day, if we keep on dreaming and working hard, there's going to be a new tomorrow. Alec, like, thank you so much for that uh, uh, generous uh, in introduction. Um, I'm a man, yes, who believes in God. I wouldn't be here without my God. Uh, but much more importantly, I wouldn't be here without my beautiful wife, Sirat. 
you want to stand up for them to see you how blessed I am? Um, yeah, I call her she who must be feared, loved, <laughs> adored, respected, and, and all the things. Uh, thank you, Sirat, for, for being here with me. Um, I also love my country. I love Zimbabwe quite passionately, uh, which is why, you know, Alec uh, Nyarad and I decided to go back uh, in uh, 2017, I think. Um, we have had interesting experiences uh, going through um, immigration. One time, my wife and I and our, our daughter were going through immigration, and the woman processing our uh, document says, your residence permit is so old. You've been in this country for such a long time. Why don't you become citizens? And we looked at her and said, but why? <laughs> We are Zimbabweans, we're very proud of being Zimbabweans, and uh, we have never thought that we should become uh, South Africans. So uh, I thought I should put that up out there. Uh, we, we are proud Zimbabweans. The, I'm going to do two things. I'm going to share with you what I see as opportunities in Zimbabwe and what I think, what I know to be the problems that the country is facing at the present moment. And then you make up your mind whether Zimbabwe offers an opportunity or is a basket case. Um, it, in doing so, I must remind you of uh, the story of uh, the two salesmen who went into a continent, uh, and one of them sent a message back and said, uh, these people have no shoes. We can't start a shoe operation uh, or sell them shoes because they don't, they don't know anything about shoes. And the other salesman says, these people have no shoes. Please, can you ship as many shoes as possible? That's what my country is right now. You decide whether we don't have shoes and we'll never wear shoes, uh, or we don't have shoes. If you ship them, we might put them on. So it's up to you to decide what, uh, uh, what the situation is and what works for you and what your risk appetite is. Let me start with uh, an opportunity that exists, a uh, very interesting one, in the cannabis industry, where it's become a huge opportunity in Zimbabwe. Um, um, opportunities are, it, it, the laws uh, are being uh, fine-tuned to allow people to come and invest in medicinal cannabis and in industrial hemp, and the two have been divi divided. And we're seeing a lot of uh, uh, foreign investors coming in there. A license will cost you 57 Zimbabwean dollars. Do you want to go in? So 57 US dollars, I'm sorry. There's also an interesting thing which um, you will not uh, read in, in books and, or in magazines about what's happening in Zimbabwe is that there is an amazing building boom in a country where there is no mortgage finance, in a country where banks can't uh, afford to lend people to uh, uh, money to build houses. Uh, the part, to a very large extent, that building boom is being financed by diaspora remittances, which um, in 2020 were one billion US dollars. In 2021, those remittances stood at 1.4 billion US dollars. Um, so there's a building boom there with everything that goes with uh, uh, what is required uh, for a building boom. You'll know we are an agricultural country to a very large, ex large extent. Uh, with agriculture supplying 60% of uh, raw materials, maybe slightly lower than that uh, now because of uh, the health of agriculture. The biggest uh, crop is cotton. Um, sorry, the second largest is cotton. Um, uh, if only we could have GMOs or the wi political willingness uh, to, uh, to have GMOs, that would uh, increase production. Soybeans. Uh, at the moment, we're producing only 30% 30 per 30 of our national requirements, and the return on investment on soybeans in Zimbabwe is 200%. Um, and then there's tobacco. Tobacco is, is, is the largest uh, 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 export crop, uh, contributing 11%. 11 there's also uh, a story which is true all across uh, Zimbabwe's uh, economy, Machinery and equipment has not been renewed since uh, you, uh, the end of or UDI, let me, let me say. So irrigation equipment has, uh, has, has, has gone rust. Uh, machinery equipment, the need for fertilizer, 
insecticides and pesticides. We are also a mining country with uh, over 40 um, occurrences of, uh, of uh, minerals. Uh, diamonds, platinum, gold, uh, lithium. It's said that we are the largest, we have got the largest uh, lithium deposits uh, on, the African, on the African continent, which is very interesting. Oil and gas prospection have become, exploration rather, have become huge. And, and another thing that got me excited in 2017, when I, I could see the possibility of a new Zimbabwe, thinking that Robert Mugabe is gone, we can now rebuild, is the, 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 the opportunity that lies in mining exploration, um, because we don't know exactly how much there is un under the ground, and the investments that's required to do that. Unfortunately, that has not uh, uh, happened, it hasn't taken place. Tourism, as you know, Vic Falls, Kariba, and, and, all, and, and, and cultural tourism and so forth are, are huge things. Um, uh, is, tourism is a big thing in Zimbabwe, but ro road infrastructure, rail, uh, airports and, and policy issues still uh, are a huge impediment to um, uh, tourism being able to, to come in and contribute uh, uh, full force. Uh, Alec, that means 13 minutes to go? Is it? Okay, good. Um, then national infrastructure. National infrastructure for the past 42 years, sadly, uh, our roads, our railways, water and sewage, uh, uh, water reticulation, um, have not been attended to, and that it total disrepair. It's a crisis, it's also an opportunity. Um, and uh, it presents an opportunity for investors to come in. I'll tell you why you might think twice about wanting to, 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 uh, to do that um, uh, le le later on. In, in, any, in, in, if, in fact, like I said yesterday, the roads network in Zimbabwe has been declared a national disaster. That's a good and a bad thing. Um, funds are being deployed, national funds are being deployed to build roads, but that brings in an element of corruption, an element of state capture and so forth, but it does present an opportunity uh, for, for investment as it, as it were. Let me take ba you back to what uh, Alec was talking about. So the new dispensation arrives in 2017, and uh, Nyaradz and I get excited and we say, this is it, let's go home, and there was a buzz amazing buzz, um, you know, Zimbabwe things are going to, ha are going to begin happen, uh, to happen, rather. And I was one of those people that stood up, first of all, uh, perhaps the first people that stood up and said, give Emerson Mnangagwa a chance, and how wrong I was. Um, but why did I say that? I said that because I, I said, this man has sat in the same room with Robert Mugabe. He's seen what Robert Mugabe did in the country. Maybe he's really interested in turning things around. Point number one. Point number two, this man were, played a role as far as Gukura Wound is concerned, the massacre of over 20,000 people in Matebele land. Maybe it's time for him to make amends for, for that. So I was generous in my spirit as a God-fearing man that this man was about to do uh, a turnaround. Again, was I disappointed. I was actually approached and agreed to serve in the Presidential uh, Advisory Council. So I, I've been, as I've said, at close range with the President, uh, advising him on, on, on a number of issues. But I've since retired, stepped down, because I can see this thing is not going to end well. I think the lesson that we've uh, gotten for all of us is that uh, anybody who embarks on a coup does not usually do so because uh, they want uh, uh, to promote democracy uh, widen uh, economic prosperity and, and so forth. The people that launched the uh, coup in Zimbabwe were interested in, in, in protecting their small personal interests, ethnic interests, business interests, and economic interests. It was not for the benefit of, uh, of everybody else, and we are seeing it in terms of uh, from what, we are, what has been happening since 20, uh, 2017. So what has been happening? We have seen, we, if we thought Robert Mugabe was bad, but uh, sadly, um, uh, President Mnangagwa um, has shown an amazing degree of doing things worse than Robert Mugabe uh, ever did. Um, the, perhaps the most frightening thing that uh, President Rob, uh, Mnangagwa has done is the mutilation of our constitution and the capture of our judiciary. If there's anything that frightens me right now is that. Alec was sharing with you the fact that um, when I lost my, when they took away my passport, I went to court and fought 
in the confidence that there will be a judiciary that will argue my case, and uh, rather that will listen to my case fairly, and I would win the case. And did, indeed that happened. They took away my citizenship. I, I, I got lawyers to fight. I got my citizenship uh, back because there was a judiciary that was professional. That is no longer the case, and that frightens me. Zimbabwe, uh, good people, has become what... Uh, um, um, Darren Asimoglu and James uh, Robinson, the authors of uh, Why Nations Fail, they have a new book right now called The Narrow Corridor, uh, and, and it has become what is called a pepper levithian. Uh, and this is a government that is, one, unable to provide uh, public services, uh, unable to protect its citizens, only protects its interests. It gets very aggressive and very efficient when it comes to protecting its, its, its interests. Um, sadly, I'm, I'm afraid to say Zimbabwe is teetering, is teetering on the edges of being a failed state when it comes to, when it comes to that. National institutions um, have been captured. Parliament, uh, the police force, uh, it breaks my heart uh, when you see what the police force has uh, is, is, is now become. It's an instrument of the, pol of the politicians. Parliament has been uh, is, is, is a place where mediocrity is displayed in full force and as a result uh, has become ineffective in terms of being a check, uh, checking, uh, ch a check on what um, uh, the executive uh, does. You have seen when it comes to the failure to deliver the pub this public services, um, you know, teachers are on strike, the, pub the civil servants are on strike, stri strike, doctors are on strike. USA has said that... Um, um, there's a danger of uh, hunger in Zimbabwe. Uh, this is uh, a country that had a bumper harvest two years ago, but there's a danger of hunger in Zimbabwe because our currency is losing value like somebody opening a tape and water uh, just gushing out. Uh, yesterday it was one to one to twenty one one US dollars will cost you 127 uh, Zimbabwean dollars on the official market. On the parallel market, it will cost you between 220 to 300. Um, and you, there's so many uh, number of um, uh, uh, places where you can get to get a quarter of uh, what the, the, the dollar is. Very interesting headlines that you can only find in Zimbabwe. One headline says, 24,355 motorists arrested over unregistered vehicles. Fascinating, isn't it? 22,000 learners stranded as government shuts down unlicensed schools. Um, very interesting. And there's a new suburb as you, a new suburb as you drive uh, from, uh, from the airport to, to the airport, which we had a, red, a headline the other day that says the suburb is going to be demolished because it was built unlawfully. Where does that kind of thing happen except in Zimbabwe? Um, I see my time is running out. Um, the, the other opportunity and interesting thing, Alec, is that uh, Zimbabwe has become a dual economy. The biggest part of the economy is the informal economy, where 70% of um, uh, act economic activity takes place. The other 30% is the official uh, uh, side of the economy, where the, the, the government policy has an effect on that. So at the end of the day, the people that decide economic activity are is the informal sector where 70% of the people operate. But listening to Stafford Massey right now, that could be an opportunity. Maybe that's where uh, Bitcoin uh, ought to, um, uh, to be circulating. Um, currency has become a big issue in Zimbabwe. It's, it's caused instability uh, all across the economy because you get up in the morning, you, never, you don't know what, what, at what rate you'll be able to stock uh, the products and services that, that you, you want because the current currency fluctuates quite a lot. We are actually, the government says we have not dollarized, that we are actually moving away from dollarization. The evidence on the ground is that we are dollarizing at a fast rate. Nobody has confidence on the local currency. Pre people prefer to have in their pockets the U.S. dollar because it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a place that will serve, uh, secure the value of what they, of what they have. Um, I see my time is running out, Alec. Let me, le I'm going to conclude, obviously. Alec is going to ask me uh, questions by saying that where do I stand as far as Zimbabwe is concerned? I think if you ask me right now, I am very negative and pessimistic about where the country is. In the long term, I am pretty optimistic. My optimism flows from the young people, 
flows from, flows from my child, my daughter was 16 years old, um, who has dreams, the African dream, that at some point, and not too long, um, the, the, um, the fascination about people who part participated in the liberation war of Zimbabwe is going to die down. That the young people who are 67% of the Zimbabwean population, our population uh, is 67, 30, people be below 35 years of age constitute 67% of the population. That's where my hope comes from. Um, do I have confidence in MDC? Uh, it's now called uh, uh, something else. Um, no, I don't. Do I see anybody right now in Zimbabwe with the capacity to turn things around? Not right now. I have no confidence in the opposition because I don't see anybody who's got the vision, the passion to change the country forward. I have no conf confidence in ZANU-PF because they have participated in the destroying of the country and destroying the society. My last comment is going to be here. That, you know, it's interesting when you, when you read and watched apartheid and how you can uh, change the society through policies. Fascinating how ZANU-PF has changed Zimbabwe through the ways that ZANU-PF uh, conducts itself. How corruption, how mediocrity, how baseness, violence has become the way that the majority of Zimbabweans do business without realizing it. There is violence in the opposition political parties because they have seen ZANU-PF being violent, violent and getting away with it. There is state-sponsored violence that is paralyzing uh, the, demo the democratic space. We don't have yet uh, a Nelson Mandela. We don't have yet somebody who sees a vision and is calling on anybody to follow that vision in terms of delivering uh, a, a new Zimbabwe. It's, it's, it's a sad case, but it's a case which I think is going to end well, but it might take time. Thank you very much.